The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. We're in our fifth of seven messages as we speed through the, the epistle of 1 John. And uh, when compared to Ken's length of time in 1 Peter, this is a jet tour. And so we have a few more weeks left. Would you turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3? <clears throat> we have a rich section in front of us. We have a long section in front of us. And I, th- I trust that in the power of the Spirit will be a blessing to each one. 1 John chapter 3, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you desiring to hear from you, desiring to know and to have confidence that we are in you. Would you do that work this morning through your word, through your spirit, testifying to the word? Would you be glorified and magnified and we'll give you praise for it. Convict where that's needed, encourage where that's needed. Would you empower very much where that's needed. Give us <clears throat> understanding to know and to uh, embrace the truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Throughout the book of 1 John, John has been wanting us to know, to know certain things. And through the book, he gives us tests or evidence, ways that we can know what's truth and what's error. And often he uses the phrase, by this. By this we can know this is true, and by this you can know that this person is false, and by this you can ascertain and determine what's true. In chapter 5, verse 13, he summarizes the purpose for writing the book. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know with confidence that you have eternal life. We're going to be looking at 1 John 3, 18 through 4.10, so it is a significant uh, length of text. And immediately before this section was uh, in chapter 3, what Sean preached on last week, uh, 3, 7 through, uh, sorry, 3, 11 through 17 was the immediate context before our context this morning, the contrasting of two children. And uh, John Stott summarizes it this way, hatred characterizes the world whose prototype is Cain, It originates in the devil, issues in murder, and is evidence of spiritual death. Love characterizes the church, whose prototype is Christ. It originates in God, issues in self-sacrifice, and is evidence of eternal life. So after comparing and contrasting uh, the children of life and children of death, children of God, children of the devil... John brings us to verse 18, where he gives us a command. Little children, because of these things that we just have spoken, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. You're going to see a motif, a model uh, way that John uh, communicates in this section. He often gives the negative before he gives the positive to, to teach and reinforce the positive. So again, he says, let's not do this, do not do this, but rather do this, and you'll see that as we go on. What's his point? He's saying mere words are not enough. They have to be backed up with action. He has said already in 1 John 1, 6, if we say and yet walk in the darkness, in chapter 2, verse 4, the one who says and does not keep his commandment is a liar. 2, 9, The one who says and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. Chapter 4, verse 20, if someone says and hates his brother, he is a liar. And so throughout the book, he's saying, you can say what you want. You can claim fellowship with God. You can claim I'm a child of light. You can say whatever you want, but if it's not backed up by your actions, your words mean nothing. And so here as well, little children, don't just love in word and tongue, but in deeds and in truth. In truth means genuinely, with genuine motives. Agape love results in action. 
just as uh, it was mentioned in verse 16, that we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So, so John gives a bit of a test or, or a, well, a command to love. Sincere believers, sincere people who want to uh, follow that command might doubt that they pass the test. And perhaps that's some of you here today. Boy, my love is often self-serving. My obedience is faltering. It's, it wavers. My faith is often weak. Did I pray the right prayer? Was I sincere enough? Did I say the right thing? Did I really mean it? Am I really a Christian? I think honest evaluation is good, and often it might result in doubt. Am I really a Christian? And we're going to address that this morning. What causes a lack of assurance? I think for some of us, we have a, maybe a more natural disposition to self-introspection and uh, maybe a little bit of morbid self-introspection and really parsing motive and, and heart matters uh, very carefully. Sometimes it's a specific sin or a pull of the flesh. Well, I still struggle with this thing, and, if, and so that, maybe that means I'm not a Christian because I'm not seeing any victory over it. How can I be a Christian if I keep doing that? Curiously enough, it can be in an in a environment of strong preaching. And I believe that's here at Southside where we lift up the holy standard of God, his holiness and his righteousness and his expectation as well as the gospel. And those are balanced. Those are, mutual, those are married. And yet with strong preaching, when, when uh, the truth is proclaimed forcefully and compassionately, there could be a tendency or uh, a temptation to doubt. Boy, I don't live up to that standard. Am I really a Christian? <clears throat> Maybe that's some of some here. Doubt or, or lack of assurance could also be because I don't really accept or understand God's full forgiveness of my sins. He loves me. I know myself. How could he love me? It could be a result of bad theology or lack of understanding of the gospel, true understanding of the gospel, gospel of, of forgiveness. It could be a wrong perspective of trials. If I was truly a child of God, he wouldn't let me undergo this. And so maybe I'm not really a Christian. It could also be the result of an overactive or an underinformed conscience. <clears throat> um, I can't, we don't have time to fully explain and, and explore the conscience, and so I would commend to you our church practices Sunday school class. Um, we repeat that every so often. And one of the modules or classes there is on commands, principles, and conscience where we can go more in, into depth about the conscience. But I'm just going to give some high-level um, thoughts on the conscience. Everyone has a conscience. You are born, if you're human, everyone here has a conscience. The conscience is a God-given faculty of self-knowledge and self-evaluation that approves or condemns our thoughts, our motives, and our actions. It's a warning system, like, like pain is in our body. Our nervous system is a warning system telling us that something is wrong. And uh, we should never violate our conscience. It's clear in Scripture. But the conscience is not infallible. It's not the same as the voice of God. And it reacts to the highest moral standard that we understand. So if you have a low understanding of morality and what's right and wrong, your conscience will respond accordingly. If you have a high and sometimes overly high standard, even beyond what God says, of what is right, your conscience will be over-stimulated or over-informed. Uh, conscience can be weak by not knowing, not understanding the truth, and not being strengthened by grace. It can be seared by continual violation. So many important concepts about the conscience, um, but it needs to be biblically informed and strengthened by grace, and, and Lord willing, that's what we're doing here at Southside. But John, as a pastor, is tenderly in a pastoral manner, addressing the matter of assurance with, um, with his flock. He addresses them in verse 18 as little children. Uh, that's the 
The same word that was used in chapter 2, verse 12, that Nate explained, technion. Everyone who's in the family, you're in the family. I'm talking to you, my beloved children. And he's not surprised that there might be a lack of assurance among his flock. He says in verse 20, depending on your translation, um, it might say whenever our heart condemns us or if our heart condemns us. Or uh, the NAS says in whatever our heart condemns us. He's not surprised that people could be, um, have lack of assurance of their salvation. And therefore, he's addressing that. And so I, I want to address that this morning. Um, our outline for the text is chapter 3, 19 to 24, gospel-based assurance. Then we're going to move to chapter 4, 1 through 6, gospel-based discernment. And then chapter 4, 7 through 10, gospel based love. A favorite topic of John. All right, so let's read 1 John 3, 19 to 24. <clears throat> we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. In whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in them, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. John brackets this first section with the, with the words, by this. He says in verse 19, we will know by this. There's something that we can show objectively that gives us um, confidence and assurance that we're in Christ. And then he says in verse 24, we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. And so I would like to suggest to you um, five evidences of true spiritual life that give us assurance that we are in Christ. Hopefully this will be encouragement to you. And let's just note that to gain assurance, John doesn't go back to the past. He doesn't go back to, well, I, I walked an aisle when I was seven and, or I prayed a prayer with a minister when I was 13. Um, I, I was baptized at some point in my past. He doesn't go back to the past. He looks at present faith. He looks at present, current fruit as evidence. He does not rely on the past. He's looking to what's true of me now. And uh, may that be true of us. Five evidences of true spiritual life that give us assurance that we belong to him. Evidence number one is demonstrated love of the brother. We already read this in verse 18. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Demonstrating agape love, self-sacrificial love, in response to needs, is an evidence that I truly belong to the Lord Jesus. This, this love was mentioned in, in verse 16 as displayed by God. And his example is our motivation to do so in response to our brothers. It includes a, a heart desire from the heart, not just an outward have-to compliance, but a heart desire to honor and please uh, our Father, uh, which the world doesn't have, even if they seem to, to demonstrate self-sacrificial love. And there, there are examples of that in the world. But are they doing it from a heart motive to honor God and not just to uh, honor myself or appease my conscience that I can earn enough favor with God by this act? It is, it is this agape love is a work of the Holy Spirit. It is not natural to man. Man on his own will not show agape love. And so, Paul, or John says, if you have agape love for your brethren, that is an evidence. By this, we will know that we are of the truth and, and assure ourselves before him. Secondly, evidence number two is our ability to look to an all-knowing and loving father. Let's read verse 20. In whatever our heart condemns us, well, we'll start with verse 19b, and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. That phrase, God is greater than our hearts, could be very terrifying 
or very comforting. It's, it could be terrifying because God does not minimize sin. He does not wink at sin. He does not approve of sin. And he will and must punish sin and has to do that because of his character. He does not minimize it. And he knows the depth of my sin, even the sin I'm not aware of. Psalm 19, the psalmist says, uh, cleanse me or acquit me even of hidden faults, even the things I don't know about. You, Father, know about them. Acquit me and forgive me for those. So God is, is greater than our heart, and he does know all things. And that is a terrifying prospect um, if we're not looking to him as our, uh, in, a, in the gospel as our saving father. However, he also knows the depth of his love, which was expressed in the gospel, and the completeness of his forgiveness that he gives us in the gospel. Because of my faith in Christ, he declares me, which is a gift from him as well, he declares me not guilty. He declares me righteous, clothed with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that when he looks at me, he sees the righteousness of his own son. That's what's true, and that's what he knows. Whether I can see it in myself, in my actions, in, my, in the fruit of my life, uh, he can see that. He, he sees me in Christ and does not condemn me. And so when my conscience needlessly condemns me, um, I can appeal. I have the right to appeal to a higher standard, a higher court, and that's my loving Heavenly Father. Now, balance that. This is not an excuse to be flippant or to be presumptive. Oh, I don't need to work on anything or I don't need to be obedient in this area or confess sin. It doesn't uh, give us permission to violate our conscience. It does not give us permission to ignore true conviction. But when we're dogged, by condemnation. We have the right as sons and daughters of God to appeal not to our conscience as the highest authority in my life, but to God himself, the one who knows me and knows what's true about me and the one who defines what's true about me. And there are several results of this, looking to him as our heavenly father, the, the one who knows more than even what we know. Verses 21 through 22a. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. There are two results from this, and the first is confidence before God. Romans 8, 17 to 18 says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear, again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit allows us to call out him, Daddy. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. It's the testimony of his spirit with our spirit that we are children of God. Several years ago, the elders had a retreat down near Pagosa Springs, and we were in a beautiful cabin in a wooded area, and some of us were on the back uh, patio admiring the view. And Ken, I don't know if he's going to remember this, but he said something to this effect, I'm at peace with the God who made all of this. There's a man who understands that he has a heavenly father who knows him and knows the truth about him. He's got confidence before God. Now you may say, well, that's his job. He's a minister. I say that's, that's one who knows his right as a son to, to come before his God with confidence. He's at peace with the God of the universe. One of my favorite hymns is Arise, My Soul, Arise. We sing that periodically here. And the fifth verse of that says, My God is reconciled. His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me for his child. I can no longer fear. With confidence, I now draw nigh. With confidence, I now draw nigh. And Father, Abba, Father, cry. <clears throat> is that your confidence today? Secondly, John says that having um, a heart that does not condemn us because God is greater than our heart gives us boldness in prayer. We can pray with boldness and with confidence. And our prayer, of course, as it says in, in 1 John 5, 14, is in line with his will. It's not just a blank check that, oh, I, now I get my Ferrari that I was hoping for all these days. No, my prayers will be in conformity with his will um, if I truly am one of his children. Evidence of of having true life involves loving the brethren and being able to appeal to God as my heavenly father. Third, 
Third evidence is obedience and seeking to please him. Verse 22b through 24a. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. Obedience and seeking to please God is an evidence that I belong to him. Obedience is generally spoken of in a general sense in verse 22b. This comes from a heart of gratitude. This is a response of being in Christ. It's not meritorious. It's not to gain that standing. It's because I'm in that standing. Pastor Greg shared his uh, Sunday school, some of his Sunday school class notes with me, and they were helpful in preparing for this. And his notes on 1 John uh, say this. The verbs we receive, we keep, and we do are present active indicative verbs indicating that this is the general ongoing practice for God's children. I think any of you who are fathers understand and know that it's a natural desire for children to please their fathers. And so in the same with us, as spiritual sons and spiritual daughters, um, seeking to please him through obedience, not, again, not to gain his favor, but because we have his favor. That's a natural response of one who's in, who is in fellowship with him. John then talks obedience specifically. It was generally mentioned in verse 22, but then specifically, here is the command that God gives us in verses 23 to 24a. And what is his command? He has one command, and this summarizes the book of 1 John. It summarizes the gospel. His command is a coin with two sides. One command. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. There's a vertical dimension, and that's believing in the Lord Jesus, and that's faith. The other side of that coin, and it cannot be divorced from it, is horizontally loving the brethren. That's obedience. That's practice. That's ethics. That's living out the faith that we have in Jesus. Obedience shows that we abide in God and he in us from verse 24. The word abides means to remain united, united with. And again, this is not the basis of our union. Our obedience is not the basis of us abiding. I can abide because I obey. No, I obey because I abide. And John is saying, um, your obedience, your seeking to please God, is an evidence that you belong to him. Number four, evidence that I belong to Christ to give me assurance is present faith in Christ. Back to verse 23. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Believing in his name means believing in his person, who he is and his work, what he did on the cross in the gospel. And so that is our commandment that we're commanded to do, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Again, it's looking away from ourselves. It's looking to him as the only one who could save us and submitting to his lordship. It's, all, it's not just acknowledging him, it's submitting to him as our savior and lord. Uh, as Ken likes to say, he's our center reference point. No longer am I the one ruling my life at the center of my life, it's him. And if that's true, that's an evidence that you are in Christ. Do I have present faith in him? Also in verse 23, John reiterates evidence number one, which is love of the brethren. Again. That's, his, uh, that's how um, we're showing uh, objectively that we're in Christ. One way is to love the brethren. And then fifthly, um, the fifth evidence that gives us assurance is the testimony of the Holy Spirit in verse 24b. We know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. And I really appreciated how John Piper uh, explained part of uh, this part of the book. He said, the Holy Spirit testifies to his reality and his presence and his power in the life of a believer by doing these two things, the fruit of love and the confession of faith from the heart. So we have one commandment to believe and to love. And and who empowers that? Who allows that? It's the Holy Spirit residing in us. And so if he's in, in us 
empowering us to do those things, uh, that's an evidence that we belong to God. And we might be tempted to look at the end of verse or chapter three and the beginning of chapter four as a hard break. Okay, now he's moving away from love and he's going to discernment, and that is true. However, I would uh, submit to you that John is actually showing and giving further evidence of what the Spirit does, those two things, um, guiding us to have faith in Christ and to love each other in these next two sections we're going to look at. Verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4 is on discernment. But he's not just giving us negative things to look out for. He also gives us some positive signs or evidence in this that show that we have faith in Christ. And so the Holy Spirit is empowering us as sons and daughters in chapter 4 to have faith in Christ as we exercise discernment. Then in um, verses 7 through 10, actually 7 through the end of the chapter, he goes back to love. And again, this is a, a way the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to bring evidence. Um, if we have this, this love, it's an evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to uh, demonstrate that. So don't look at chapter 4 as a hard break in topic um, from chapter 3. It's actually a continuation demonstrating the Spirit's activity and power to uh, confess faith in Christ and to demonstrate love, continual evidences that he's in us and that we're in Christ. John Stott uh, says this, The Spirit, whose presence is the test of Christ living in us, manifests himself objectively in our life and conduct. It is he who inspires us to confess Jesus is, as the Christ come in the flesh, as John immediately proceeds to show in chapter 4. It is he also who empowers us to live righteously and to love our brothers and sisters, also chapter 4. So if we would set our hearts at rest when they accuse and condemn us, we must look for evidence of the Spirit's working, and particularly whether he is enabling us to believe in Christ, to obey God's commands, and to love our brothers. So if you struggle with assurance, am I truly in Christ today? Don't look at the past, but look at what's true of you. Do you have love for the brethren? Do you have confidence to look to God as your Father, your loving Heavenly Father, do you have a life of obedience? Does obedience to his commands characterize your life? Do you have present faith in Christ? And do you see evidence of the Holy Spirit giving you and, and enabling you to continue showing faith in Christ and loving your, your brothers? Let's go to gospel-based discernment while not forgetting the need for assurance. In verses 1 through 6 of John, 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, whom you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John, again, in a pastoral tone, is addressing his little flock as beloved, agapatoi, beloved ones. Dear friends, those who are loved. And if you can see, that has the fruit or the root of agape uh, in that word. Again, in verse 1, he gives us the negative command and then the positive. What does he say? He says, do not believe every spirit. Why does he say every spirit? Every proclamation that claims to be from God or to be the truth has an energizing spirit behind it, either the spirit of truth or the spirit of error. And so John is saying, don't be gullible. Don't believe everything you hear. If you're, maybe you've done this to your kids. Do you know the word gullible is not in the dictionary? Oh, really? No, you just proved it. Uh, you're gullible. Um, John says, do not be gullible. And his positive command is, but test. 
The, the Greek word there is dokimazo, which is from 1 Peter 1, 7. When Ken explained that, God uh, refines our faith to prove it, to, to test it, to ensure that it's genuine. And so dokimazo is to prove, to prove something, whether it's worthy or not. And so he says to test it, whether it's worthy. And that requires rigor. It requires effort. It requires thought. It requires understanding and knowing and applying the truth. It assumes that you know your Bible. So that you can be like a Berean in Acts 17. They didn't look at Paul with suspicion, but they did want to confirm what he was saying against the scripture. And that's the standard that we compare, mes our, whatever message we hear, that's what we compare it against is the standard of, of scripture. And why do, are we not to believe every spirit, but instead to test every spirit? John gives the answer, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So beloved, not all messages are from God. And understand that. Jesus even warned of this in Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. When Paul was saying goodbye to the elders at Ephesus in Acts 20, 28 to 29, he says, be on guard for yourselves and for the flock. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And even from your own number, men will rise, drawing away disciples after them. Peter says so in 2 Peter 2.1, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Jude, when he was writing his letter, changed his entire topic because certain persons have crept in unnoticed. And so even from the beginning, we're not even 100 years beyond the life of Christ. Already there were false messages about Christ and who he was and, and the gospel and being rightly related to God. And so uh, if that was happening 2,000 years ago, how much more do we need to be on guard? Even from the beginning, Satan's strategy has been to twist and to create doubt and distortion and to deny what God says. In Genesis 2, when he talks to Eve, did God really say this, casting doubt? And she responds and adds to what the command was, and maybe Satan somehow planted that in her mind, or uh, certainly encouraged it. She said, we can't eat it or touch it. So he creates distortion, and then he uh, denied, you will not die. And so his, his goal is to create doubt, distortion, and denial of what God has said. He's been doing it from the beginning, and he does it now through men, women, and messages that appear maybe 99.9% .9 correct, but there's that one little bit of error, one little compromise from spiritual truth that, from scriptural truth, that causes um, it to be a message not from God, but from the evil one. So John says to test, and he gives us three tests uh, how to test the spirits, the messages that we hear. Test number one, and the biggest one, you test their Christology. What do they say about the Lord Jesus Christ? Verses two and three. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Uh, here once, John gives the positive first. And I think this goes back to the message from chapter 3 about assurance. What does he say? By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. If that's you... If you are able to confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's an utterance, that's a truth and that is empowered and the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit, and he's behind that. That gives you assurance that you have faith from verse 23 of chapter 3, that you have faith in Christ and belong to him. So it's stated positively first, uh, and then we'll get to negatively. So Christology is very important. And that involves a full confession and submission to the person, the full person and work of Jesus Christ. In Sunday school this morning, 
of all things. What did uh, Greg teach on? He was filling in for Robin, who's not here. He spoke on the, hum the humanity and the importance and the vitality and the need, the requirement for the humanity of Christ. That was, the, that was the error that John was fighting against back in 1 John. The false teachers saying, well, Jesus, he didn't really come in the flesh. He, he was maybe a good man, but he wasn't really truly human. He didn't really uh, suffer for our sins. And, and John is combating that saying, if, if any message does not confirm that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that is not from God. Confession is the word homologeo, which is the same word that was in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. That means to say the same thing. But it's not just to say it in words, but to say it with a response of life and a, and a life that matches the words in submission and agreement um, to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the one who confesses by both their words and their life, the life and, and making sure it goes all the way to, to submission to him as Lord, that is the message that is from God. Jesus was and is fully God and fully man. He lived eternally with the Father and the Spirit and was the one true and sole human fit to be the substitute for man in dealing with sin. And without full agreement of these, all these facts, that he was fully God, fully man, and, and the only one able to be the true sacrifice, without full agreement, there is no gospel that message, if that doesn't agree with that, is not from God. Every two years, let me back up a little bit. Um, in the elders meeting on, on Wednesday mornings, we're going through a study of the titles given to Jesus in Scripture. And this past Wednesday was my turn. And this, the, the title was the, be the Beginning of the Creation of God from Revelation 3.14. If you look at it just on the surface, those words, the beginning of the creation of God, gives an indication that Jesus was the first one created. But the, the word in Revelation 3.14 is arche, which, which can be used in a time sense, and that does mean beginning. Mark 1.1 1, 1 says the beginning of the gospel. Here's the beginning, here's where it commenced. But um, the word also means beginner, and in, in the context of Revelation 3.14, he's not just the beginning, he's the beginner. He's the originator. He's the ruler of creation. He has the place of preeminence, not just prominence, but preeminence over creation. And so our discussion on Wednesday brought to mind to Robin um, something that he received, I think, from his wife, um, that Ligonier Ministries, which is the ministry from R.C. Sproul, every two years they do a survey to get a finger on the pulse of evangelicalism. And so Robin shared with us the results of that survey that was in 2018. And it's a series of questions to get the state of theology. And one of the questions was this, or statements. Jesus was the first, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. 78% of professing evangelicals said, I agree with that. I hope that was none of you who responded to that survey, um, unless you were part of the 22. Can you see how in small ways, I mean, that, the, the cults jump on that. Yeah, Jesus was, is the brother of Satan, and Jesus was, it was a great man, but he was, created, he was the first one created by God, and yeah, he's pretty important, but he's not the eternal son of God. And so somehow, I guess we're failing to fully proclaim the, the true aspect of who Christ is if 78% of professing evangelicals agree with the statement that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. We need to be careful that we're teaching and accepting the true reality of who Christ is. So we test Christology and, and the full acceptance of, of, of who Christ truly is. Verse 3 then negatively says, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and now it is already in the world. 
So all religions that do not acknowledge and submit to Jesus as fully God and fully man and rely on his substitutionary atonement are not from God. Acknowledging a historical Jesus who is inspiring us to do good and, and have peace on earth and goodwill to men, if that's all that it is, just a historic Jesus who's inspiring, that's not enough. John gives no middle ground here. He doesn't say, well, the people are trying their best and trying to feel after God and and he gives them a break on that. No, he says, if you're not fully acknowledging and submitting to the full lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, that message is not from God. It's actually against God and against Christ. It's anti-Christ. After the 9-11 tragedy that happened in 2001, I was at a place and the radio was on and uh, the president, President Bush, was giving, uh, it was an excerpt or a, a bit of speech from him. And I think I'm gonna ascribe to him the highest possible motives. But he said something to this effect, that we serve the same God, Christianity and Islam, we serve the same God. And I don't normally do this, but I said out loud, that's not true. And I couldn't give you a verse to support that at the time, but I can now. Because 1 John 4, 3 says, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And the religion of Islam does not confess Jesus as the Son of God and the only way of salvation. <clears throat> and so, um, hopefully you can now respond with understanding, not just with a blurting out, that's not true, but with understanding. It's, it's correct that it's not true because the Bible says so in 1 John 4. That, that survey by Ligonier Ministry had this question or this statement. God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. 51% said, I agree with that. John would protest violently against that. Uh, or forcefully, not violently, forcefully, he would say, that's not true. <laughs> he wouldn't do it violently. Now, we don't need to understand that many people in these false religions are sincere, but deluded. And so we don't respond with violence <laughs> or um, harsh words, but instead with compassion, humility, Courage and boldness, yes, but um, with grace and winsome speech because many of them are deluded and, and just are following what they've been taught. And so we stand firmly and we stand compassionately for the truth. So test number one to discern a message, is it from God or is it from uh, the enemy, is to test their Christology. Secondly, in verses four through 5a, is to test their origin. Is there evidence of regeneration? John says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They, in contrast, are from the world. John again says, little children, my little flock, ones who are in the faith, you are are of God. And again, this goes back to assurance. Um, the Spirit is the one who enables full confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do that, if you are able by the Spirit to confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are of God, and that will produce fruit and evidence. A Christian, in John, uh, verse, uh, 1 John 4, 4, a Christian is an overcomer. John's already spoken about overcoming in chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, when he addresses young men. He'll say it again in chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, regarding our faith. What's the, what is it that overcomes the world? It's our faith. And overcoming, what does that mean? Overcoming means not being drawn away, like these false believers were. They went out, he says earlier in the book. They went out, but you've remained. Your remaining is evidence that you have overcome them. You're still in the faith. You're not accepting their teaching. You will endure to the end. Um, and, and overcoming is not a special class reserved for the few in Christ. All of us who are in Christ are overcomers. And it's not because we're overcoming by our special ability or knowledge or 
um, our own power or to our own glory is through, is through his sustaining grace and through the work of the Spirit. Um, again, going back to chapter 3, verse 24, and the assurance we have of the evidence of the Spirit, one of that, one way that we understand is because the Spirit is allowing us to overcome through our acknowledging the Lordship of Christ, having evidence of new, new birth, generation, new regeneration. Conversely, in verse 5, they are from the world. And how can you tell? You can tell that because their teaching is ultimately of works. What can I do to gain favor with God? It's not what God has done for me. It's what I, what I can do to earn merit and favor with God. It's non-offensive because uh, you don't, you don't uh, last long when you're offending by speaking the truth. And so uh, a message from the world will be non-offensive, not exclusive. Now oh, there's many paths to God. There's, that, that's so narrow-minded to say that Jesus is the only way. There's lots of ways. And so it's non-exclusive and it's, it's ear-tickling. And Paul tells us in those, in, that there's, people are gonna wanna have their ears tickled. And those messages are not from God. Thirdly, the third test of the spirits is their authority. What message do they listen to? Verses 5b and 6. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Uh, the world listens to the message of the world. The word listens or listens to there is, is stated three times in this, these two verses. That means to hear effectually, not just to hear casually, but to hear effectually so as to perform or grant what is spoken. It means to obey, to hear and obey. So they listen uh, with the intent and purpose to obey the world. John says, if those who are truly belonging to Christ, listen to us, listen to the apostles, listen to the apostolic teaching, which now we would understand as being scripture, fully encapsulated in scripture. And so the test of the spirit is Christology. What do they say about the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they admit and submit to his full, him, him being fully God, fully man, um, his lordship? Also, John says, what is their origin? Is there evidence of regeneration in their lives? And thirdly, what is their authority? What are they listening to? Tests for, for testing the messages we hear day in and day out. Finally, in our section before us this morning is verses seven through 10, and John goes back to love. Let's read that. Beloved, there's that word again. Beloved, dear friends, let us love one another for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So three Headings for these uh, four verses, um, the exhortation to love, the essence of love, and the example of love. First of all, the exhortation to love in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So John says, he's repeating what he said before. Again, this is one of his favorite topics is to love. And he gives two reasons. The first reason is because love is from God. Love originates, agape love, not just sentimental gushiness, but um, self-sacrificing love for others originates from God. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Again, it's not natural to man, and so the world might imitate it, but cannot duplicate fully and um, completely agape love. And so this is an evidence, a fruit of those who are of God. Going back again, chapter 3, you want evidence? Do you love Verse 8, the essence of love. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So John says negatively failing to, to love proves that a person does not know God despite what he says. Again, actions 
speak louder than words. And the tense of the verb means that he never knew God in the first place. It says the one who does not know, does not love, does not know God, as if that's a present truth, and that is. But the tense of the verb actually means the one who does not love never knew God in the first place. For God is love, and if you know him, you will love. The phrase God is love, uh, it's not just an attribute of God, it's actually who he is, it's his essence. And it's demonstrated by what he does. He defines it, he's the very definition of it, his unconditional love, he demonstrates it in giving and in self-sacrifice, especially in the gospel. So then verses nine and 10, the example of love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, to be the propitiation for our sins. Some of the words to highlight here, the word manifested, the love of God was manifested in us, means to be mo- most prominently shown. Here's how God's love was most prominently shown in us means among us or in our case to Christians specifically. Here's how God's love was most primarily displayed. It was among us. It was in our case in that he sent. The, ver- the word there is apostello. We think of apostle um, to be sent forth on a mission. God's love was shown most preeminently among us in that he sent the Lord Jesus to die for our sins. And who did he send? His only begotten. The Greek word there is monogenes, which means only one of its kind or class. Again, he wasn't the only, the first created one. It's that he was the only one of that type, only one of that kind. He was unique, his one and only son. God sent his one and only preeminent loved son. And that's how he showed most prominently his love. For the purpose, so that we, may, we might have life, uh, which means having e- eternal life, life with him. Ephesians 2.1 says that we were dead and we need life. John 17.3 says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That is true life. Then in verse 10, again, he states the negative before the positive. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God is the one who initiated, not us. He didn't didn't rely on us to take the first step. He was the one who took the initiation. He provides the greatest example and the standard of love by sending Christ. That's gospel love. Romans 5.8 says um, his own love, he showed us his own love, his own type of love, his own demonstration of love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't because we were polished up and prepared to receive a savior. It was while we were sinners, hating him dead to, to God. That's when he sent Christ. And it says to be the propitiation. We went over that in Sunday school this morning. Propitiation is to appease wrath. It's to satisfy The Lord Jesus, when he died on the cross, satisfied the full wrath of God for sin, for my sin, for those who believe in him. So there is no more condemnation for me because he bore it all. He propitiated, he satisfied, he made pleased through his sacrifice um, God who was the offended party. So the amazing part of the gospel, God who was the offended party is the one who took the initiative and, and the one who made provision for salvation for sinners who, who hated him and uh, were bearing the fist against him. God did that. And it was for our sins. It was a personal thing. It was for my sin. It was for your sin that Christ died. If you get the impact of that, cleansing of sin is required for relationship with God. And he provided that in the gospel so that I could be in, in fellowship with him. It wasn't just the forgiveness of sins, as Greg stated this morning. It wasn't just the forgiveness of sins. It was to be rightly related to the God of the universe who was offended against sin, but now has been brought near through the blood of Christ. 
So, to conclude, do you struggle with assurance? There's gospel hope for you. It's not looking to the past. It's not looking to your efforts. It's not looking to how good you're doing, your, your temperature this morning of spiritual hotness, whether I had devotions this morning. No. It's looking to the present and to current fruit. Do I have love for the brethren? Am I looking to God as my loving Heavenly Father who knows me better than I know myself? And he also knows the reality of salvation more fully and and objectively than I do. Am I practicing obedience from a heart of love and gratitude, a response, again, not to earn his favor, but because I have his favor? Is that true of me? Do I have present faith in Christ? Is there evidence of the Spirit leading me to faith vertically and love horizontally? Is there evidence of the Holy Spirit's working in my life? Do I have discernment in three tests to test the gospel through gospel lenses? Any message we hear? What is their Christology? What is, the, is there evidence of regeneration, of being of God? And what do they listen to as their authority? And then love is God's essence of love and his demonstration of love in sending Christ. Is that the grand motive for me to love my brothers? In talking with Greg before uh, coming uh, and preparing for this message, he had this statement, I wrote it down. We cannot manufacture, cannot manufacture the motive of love for God. We can't do it. We can't manufacture it. We can look good on the outside say all the right things. We cannot manufacture the motive of love for God in the things that we do. It has to come from him. And if it is in your life because of his work, that gives great assurance. So my hope for you, the message of 1 John 3, 18 through 4.10, is there is great confidence, rightly applied, that I am in Christ and I can have that confidence and assurance, not presumption, but confidence that I truly belong to Christ and uh, am his own and am, am loved. So I trust that that'll be true for you today. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the message that you've encouraged me with that we can have understanding and knowledge and confidence that we belong to you, not because of our work, not because of our effort, not because even of our faith, but because of your gracious work, where there might be a heart of, um, of doubt today, a heart of condemnation. Do I truly belong to Christ? Would you apply your word uh, today to these hearts? And perhaps the answer is no, because I never have submitted to the Lordship and the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus Christ If so, Lord, today, may that be confirmed, but then turned away from with faith, turning to to Christ for salvation. For those who who, um, have these evidences and can see their work, even in germ form, small form, would you confirm and establish, bring assurance uh, through the grace of the gospel to these hearts. Do your work in both camps today. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.